Johnny Dollar. Earl Poorman, Johnny, down here in Sarasota. Earl, so how's the insurance business down in Florida these days, to say nothing of the fishing? Well, why don't you come down here and find out for yourself? But now listen. I'm listening. You remember how my home is situated out here on St. Armand's Key? Well, sure, I ought to. I've been there often enough. Well, it's near the end of a long bayou that comes in from Sarasota Bay. Yeah, and the bayou is lined with expensive homes, private docks, and it's full of mullets, sea trout, sheep's head, flounder. So what about it? Johnny... What would you think if I told you I'd sold a man $50,000 worth of straight life insurance? Well, I think you were just doing your normal... Huh? Did you call to talk fishing or business? Listen, will you? Okay. What would I think if you sold a man a $50,000 policy? And? And then, three days later, just this morning, as a matter of fact, found his body floating under my dock. Oh. Okay, Earl. I think I'd better grab the first plane I can. That's what I think. And not to go fishing. <laughs> CBS Radio brings you Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And now, Act One of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Tri-State Life and Casualty Insurance Company, Sarasota office. Following is the account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Bayou Body Matter. Expense account item one, 7350, plane fare and incidentals, Hartford to Tampa, Florida. There I'd figured on getting a ferry plane to Sarasota, but instead Earl Poorman met me at the International Airport with his car. Oh, Johnny, I'm glad you got down here so quickly. You realize I only phoned you about five hours ago? Yeah, Earl, I just finished my breakfast. Matter of fact, I called you before I even contacted the police. Then you probably aren't sure whether it was natural death or suicide or what, huh? Now, we'll find out what the police have found out when we get to Sarasota. You ask me, though, I think the old man simply went out on his dock this morning, had a heart attack, keeled over, and by the time he floated down to my place, he was dead. Who was he? Well, his name, Johnny, is Ralph P. Carter. He lives... Rather, he lived in the fourth home up the bayou from mine. That new place that was just being built the last time I was down here? That's the one. He was a man of 64. Used to live in New York where he had a business of some kind. But he had some heart trouble, so he quit and came down here to live and take it easy. Pretty well to do? Considering the house he put up, the way he and his wife lived, I'd say he was loaded. Matter of fact, I happen to know he was. Fancy car, private dock, Has nice a speed wife, book. you say? Yes. Uh-huh. How old is she, Earl? About 50. Oh. Uh, you know what I was thinking, of course. What? Oh, if he'd been married to some much younger gal and having money and some insurance, uh, but you know. Huh? You were thinking his wife had knocked him over to collect on this policy I sold him? Such things have happened, Earl. Well, it didn't this time for several reasons. One. One. He already owned a couple of other policies issued by some company up north. Big ones, totaling over 200000 mm. Two, both he and his wife have so much in blue chip stocks, so much in the bank, that, well, that 200000 won't mean a thing to her. Funny, third, then, that he should buy 50000 more from you. Third, Carter's wife never knew about this policy I sold him. Oh? No. Nor is she named as beneficiary of it. Who is Hold your hat, Johnny. This is right out of the pulp magazines. What do you mean? The beneficiary happens to be a former stripper. Stripper? You mean from burlesque? That's exactly what I mean. Her name is Mitzi Taylor. She lives up in New York. I see. You know the uh, connection, Earl? Well, from what he told me when he bought the policy, well, I guess he'd known her pretty well in the old days, before he and his present wife got married. They were only married about three years ago, incidentally. Incidentally, huh? Yeah. Well, what's that mean? Earl, I got a kind of funny idea cooking in the back of my head. About his wife, I mean. About his wife? Yeah, let's get on down to Sarasota and find out what the police have learned. The police hadn't wasted any time. After recovering the body from the bayou, they'd immediately turned it over to the coroner, Dr. Phillips. Sergeant Edwards, who was in charge of the case, made us cool our heels until the coroner could finish his preliminary examinations. But 
Why an autopsy, Sergeant? You mean you suspect foul play, something like that? He was alone. He was unattended when he died, Mr. Pullman. That means an autopsy is mandatory. Oh. Hey, uh, tell me this, Sergeant. Do you yourself have any reason to be suspicious of how Mr. Carter may have died? You don't mind, sir. I'd rather wait until Dr. Phillips is through before we talk about it. Which means you did find something suspicious. I didn't say that, sir. Well, you might just as well have. Did you talk to Mrs. Carter? No, sir. What? It happens she isn't home. Then she doesn't know her husband is dead? Looks that way, doesn't it? Oh, come on. Now, wait a minute. Sergeant, that's a pretty evasive answer. Truth is, Mr. Dollar, it was meant to be. Oh, great, great. Then I can expect a lot of cooperation from this department. All we can possibly give you, sir. When we find out what we have to go on. Yeah. Earl, do you know if Carter had a regular physician? Uh, yeah, Dr. Theo Foote, Johnny. We've checked with him, Mr. Dollar. And? Mr. Carter's heart condition was such that he was ready to go at any moment. And without warning. But if you're suspicious of something else? Have I given you any real reason to be suspicious? Now, look, Sergeant, let's not be... Oh, uh, Dr. Phillips. Johnny. Johnny Dollar. Hiya, Doc. I might have known you'd be called in on this, Johnny. You certainly got down here in a hurry. Mr. Pullman. Hello, Coroner. Did you find out anything, Doctor? You were right, Sergeant. I've got a lot more work to do, of course, before making out my report on this case, but there's no question about it. Mr. Carter died neither from a heart attack nor from drowning. Oh? What did kill him, Doc? He was struck so hard at the face of the skull that death must have been instantaneous. Murder, Johnny. And without question, the murder weapon was the wrought iron poker that you found there in his home. No reason for suspicion, Sergeant? Thanks, Doctor. I'll get out an APB on Mrs. Carter right away. I think you'd better. And, Mr. Dollar, I'm afraid you'll just have to wait around until we pick her up. You, uh, want to bet on that? Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. And now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and the Bayou Body Matter. operation, Mr. Dollar, and as soon as we get any word as to the whereabouts of Mrs. Carter, we'll let you know. Yeah, thanks a lot. Earl, just how much did you know about Carter and his wife? Well, you know how it is, Johnny. There was some talk about their not getting along too well, but... I've thoroughly investigated, Mr. Dollar. They fought like cats and dogs. Well, now, I wouldn't go so far as to say that. At times, that is. At times. According to the people next door, they had quite an argument just last night. Oh, At one time, according to these people, she hollered at him, I could kill you, Ralph. I could kill you. Yeah, well, that's not proof that she did. No? Then why would she say... haven't you ever told somebody you'd like to kill him? Well, saying I'd like to or saying I could or would are two different things. And look here, sir. If she didn't do it, then why would she hightail it out of town early this morning? All those neighbors reported that she did? Yes, sir. She drove away from their place at approximately the same time as the coroner says he was killed. Well, let's face it, Johnny. The sergeant must be right. She must have done it. No question about it, Mr. Dollar. But why? What could her motive have been? Who knows? Could have been most anything. Now that we know there was friction between them... And what about his money? She stands to be worth an awful lot with him out of the way. And don't you forget for one minute she's much younger than he was. Not only that, but she's a nice, healthy, attractive woman, too. And he, with his heart condition... Well, he was probably just a millstone around her neck. Makes sense, Johnny. Sure it does. Did you or the coroner find any fingerprints on that poker that was used on him? No, sir. But there was some lint from a pair of cotton gloves on it. All right, then. Johnny. All right. I've seen Mrs. Carter many times. She prides herself on her dress. She can afford to. And I've never seen her outside that house without a hat and without a pair of gloves. And, of course, a lot of people wear gloves when they drive a car. Okay, okay, Now, don't you worry, Mr. Dollar. The APB is out in every highway north of Bradenton, south of Venice, and east of Arcadia is being watched for. When we get out, I'll let you know. Yeah, you do that. Come on, Earl, let's have some lunch. Sure. Nothing more we can do here. Reach you at Mr. Pullman's house, I take it. Don't bank on it, Sergeant. So Earl drove me to his home on St. Armand's Key, and by then I was beginning to wish I'd made the trip to Florida solely for purposes of fishing the blue waters of the Gulf with him. But then, after saying hello to his charming wife and having a drink and a good lunch with them, I walked over to the Carter place, a hundred yards or so up the bayou. Much to my surprise, there was no policeman there to keep an eye on things in case Mrs. Carter should return. I was even more surprised to find a side door standing wide open. So, needless to say, I walked in and looked around. 
One of the first things that caught my eye in a den off the living room was a desk. It was locked, but I managed to pry it open without too much difficulty. And there, among other things, kind of half hidden away in a folder, I found some canceled checks, a whole series of them, written twice a year for a period of over three years. They were made out to Mitzi Taylor, the ex-Burley queen. Pretty sizable checks, too, all for the same amount of money. No wonder he'd kept this desk locked. But during one period of time, well, three checks that should have been there were missing. They gave me an idea. Out in the living room was another desk, a tambour, obviously Mrs. Carter's. Hidden away in the bottom of one of the drawers of that desk were the three missing checks. Huh? I beg your pardon. Mrs. Carter? That's right. Who are you? Johnny Dollar, special investigator for one of your husband's insurance companies. Special investigator? Yeah, here. My credentials. I see. And has my husband sent for you? Your husband? Of course. Where is he? You mind telling me where you've been since early this morning, Mrs. Carter? I don't know why not. I was... I was somewhat upset this morning, and, well, being a woman, I chose to do something a man probably wouldn't understand. I've been at a beauty parlor. Where? Just this side of Bradenton. All right, now, Mrs. And Carter. And this is some kind of inquisition. I had a shampoo, a set, and a manicure. Tell me just one thing. Did you leave this house before or after your husband died? I don't believe Ralph was even up at the time. Ralph, dead. His body was found in the bayou this morning. Or did you know that? Oh, I am shocked, Mr. Dollar. Terribly shocked. I am not sorry. Go on, Mrs. Carter. I married Ralph three years ago. It was my second marriage. My first husband, though very wealthy, was a... I don't know why I'm telling you this. Go on, please. I thought that Ralph, because he was older than I, would... Well, I thought that with my money, he'd be content to settle down to the quiet sort of home life I'd owe. Don't you see? It was only for my money that he married me. The only woman he ever cared about, whom he continued to support with my money, was a... a horrible... Uh... See, you've been through my desk. Yes. I'd known about her for some time, Mr. Dollar. But yesterday, when I found those checks in his desk... Would you call them motive for murder, Mrs. Carter? I told him I would divorce him. I told him last night. I'm afraid it was quite a scene, but I... Good heavens. All right, now listen carefully. I want you to answer my questions carefully, regardless of how absurd you may think they are. Well, all right. You always wear gloves, don't you? What? Well, of course. This kind of gloves, like you're wearing now? Only this kind. I have them made for me in France and sent to me on special order. Even when you're working in the garden, say? Of course. I save the old ones for that kind of thing. Any other kind of cotton or wool or domestic leather I'm allergic to. But, Mr. Dollar, I don't understand Such why... Such a little thing. And yet... What? And yet murder cases have been solved on a whole lot less. Murder? Did you say murder? So you found her for us, Dollar. Oh, Sergeant Edwards. So maybe you private dicks do have some value after all. All right, Mrs. Carter. Yes, Sergeant. I'm arresting you on suspicion of murdering your husband. You what? Now, just a minute, May as well man. go along with him, Mrs. Carter. But Mr. Dollar, but I... I'm glad you threw that word suspicion in there, Sergeant. What's that? Yeah, it may save you from being sued for a lot of money. Huh? Yeah. For false arrest. Act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. And now, Act Three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. After getting the address of Missy Taylor from him, I persuaded Earl Palmer to drive me in a hurry to the airport up in Tampa. Item two, sixty-seven ninety-five, plane fare to New York. It was very late by the time I arrived there, but item three, six bucks for a taxi to the neighborhood of Missy's apartment. Item four, ten cents for a phone call. And then I crossed my fingers. This was hardly the scientific approach to the solution of a murder case. I wouldn't get to first base if I had to identify myself over the phone. But she gave me a break. Hello? Um, Mitzi? Yeah, that's right. This is... Louie? Yeah, Louie. What's the matter with you? Why are you talking like that? Trying to keep my voice down. Listen, didn't I tell you not to call me from down there in Florida? Come right back here and... Louie, are you back here in New York already? Took a plane. 
to take care of Ralph Carter. Don't worry, baby. It'll be in all the papers. Okay. And come on over here and I'll pay you off. Sure. But then you're to clear out. You're to get out of this town as far away from me as you can. Sure. Okay. Come on over. Yeah, a real break. Now it was up to me to take the fullest possible advantage of it. Item five, another dime for another phone call. This time to Lieutenant Randy Singer at the 18th Precinct. Well, no question about it, Johnny. Old man Carter must have known that sooner or later his wife would catch on to all the money he's been giving his dame. Right. And maybe he was getting tired of sending out those checks. Right. So to get off the hook and still provide for Mitzi, he named her as beneficiary to a $50,000 insurance policy. Sure, his wife would know about it after he died. But she wouldn't be able to do anything about it. Yeah, but little Mitzi just uh, couldn't wait, huh? Now, look, I don't anticipate any trouble with her, Randy, but if you're going to be around for a while, well, after I've wrapped it all up, I'll call you to come over and make the arrest, huh? Seems to me you have got it all wrapped up. Sit tight, Randy, and I'll call you. Mind if I come in, Mitzi? Now, who are you? Johnny Dollar, special investigator. Yeah? For who? The company that issued that $50,000 policy you are not going to collect on. You know something, Johnny? That's where you're wrong. Oh, you think so? Did you see Ralph Carter's body floating around in that bayou down there in Florida? I'm afraid I didn't. Well, you should have, Johnny. Because then you'd know what you're going to look like floating down the dirty East River. Sorry, Mitzi, but... Uh... Hey, wait a minute. How did you know Carter's body was thrown into the bayou? You took too long getting over here, Johnny, after that phony phone call. Come on in, Louie. Take care of him. What? One move for a gun and I blow your head off, mister. Go ahead, Mitzi. Take his gun away. Okay, I've got it. Now keep it on him while I take him apart so we can feed the fish out in that river. No, wait a minute. Huh? We'd like to close the door to the corridor so that... What? That's right, Mitzi. Don't bother. Cops! The cops! Drop it, Louie! <laughs> Okay, boys. Take what's left of them out of here. Right, Lieutenant. Maybe you better put some cuffs on the dame. Right. Come on, baby. Ah, hiya, Johnny. Fancy meeting you here. Very funny. And, uh, hey, what happened? I thought you were going to call me back. Oh, stop hamming it up, will you, Randy? <laughs> but, uh, thanks. <laughs> Think nothing of it. <laughs> Louis managed to survive, and I understand that the way he shut off his mouth in the hospital, well, I understand he pretty much cinched the case against both himself and Mitzi. So, expense account total, including a big midnight supper for Randy and myself and a train back to Hartford, $168.65. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Our star will return in just a moment. Now, here's our star to tell you about next week's story. Well, next week I take another trip to Florida, and I still don't get a chance to go fishing. Instead, a lesson in how not to commit a murder. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood and is written, produced, and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Lillian Byatt, Vic Perrin, Sam Edwards, Barney Phillips, Herb Bigeron, and Frank Gerstle. 